Welcome to Food Safety Month, everybody. We're glad to have you here with us today. Um, during this Food Safety Focus Month, we encourage you to explore RestaurantsRise.com. Restaurants Rise from Nation's Restaurant News and its direct access to information, insights, and solutions specific to the challenges the industry faces today. We also encourage you to visit the Food Safety 101 2020 Ecolab webinars either recorded versions or the remaining one in December. They focus on emerging trends in food safety and in public health. Next slide, please. We know that there are many challenges that the industry faces today. At Ecolab, our vision is to help provide and protect what is vital, clean water, safe food, abundant energy, and healthy environment. When we work together towards these outcomes, we improve quality of life for people everywhere. We're very excited to introduce to you Health Inspections 101 today. We're gonna to focus on one of the key pillars, food safety. Next slide, please. Thank you. One more. Great, food safety is a top concern for restaurants, guests, and their owners. So a strong food safety program in your organization is crucial to instilling confidence with your customers and it will drive business to help you protect your brand. As part of our commitment to furthering food safety, Ecolab has partnered with Nation's Restaurant News to host a series of four webinars during Food Safety Month. This is our second um, of four. Next slide please, it'll show us uh, the rest of the Food Safety Month webinar series. Uh, we'll, this series provides practical information to help you build a strong food safety program and help the industry um, rebound and during these challenging times. Today's webinar, as I mentioned, will focus on health inspection. Next week, we dive into new procedures and approaches for cleaning, sanitizing, and disinfecting. And our final Food Safety Month webinar will have a panel of industry experts who will discuss new and emerging trends in food service industry. Finally, at the bottom, we also have one more Food Safety 101 webinar in December, and that will take a look at technology and how it can help you build a strong food safety program. So let's hop into today. On the next slide, we talk about our agenda. First, we'll begin with health inspection trends, then we'll move to outbreaks and the impact on food service. We'll move into partnering with health inspections, talk about virtual inspections, and then as mentioned before, we will move into a Q&A. Let's start off with some trends. Before we begin with our panel, let's take a look at the weekly health in department inspections. This is since March. So if we look at this health inspection data, it shows year over year from July 2019 to July of 2020. And we see here that there was a 37% decrease in health inspections in the US and Canada. Now typically January, February, and March do have the highest number of health inspections, but the strong dip in March and April is unprecedented. Um, from April to April, we actually saw a 78% decrease um, so now we are seeing those numbers come up. Next slide, please. And here we can also look on health inspections focusing on COVID. Uh, so to the right of the screen, you see key words that we pull to determine if the health inspections relate to COVID-19 in any way. Uh, key words such as distancing and coronavirus on inspections single out that between 10 and 15% of inspections tie back to the current pandemic in some way. The next slide shows us consumer complaints and consumer complaints have skyrocketed uh, since this past April. 25% of jurisdictions have a 25% year or have two times of their year over year increase. And the next slide shows us some of those consumer complaints. These complaints range from alleged claims and concerns of no masks in example A to patrons not specifically social distancing and in example C, we see inconsistent disinfection. In two of these examples, uh, the regulators discussed that what the complaints were and documented the corrective action and shown that they were addressed. 
Uh, this really confirms what we know. Consumers are concerned, they're aware, and they're vocal. So in these situations, the regulators followed up and showed compliance, and it also shows a partnership. Um, the food service industry and regulators have the same goal. We're all here to protect the community. So let's learn more about regulations and inspections, starting with outbreaks and the impacts of it on food service. We're going to start off with Steve Monderdock. It's a pleasure to have him with us today. One more slide, it'll show you his bio. He's the executive director of AFTO. Prior to becoming the executive director in 2018, Mondernock was the Bureau Chief of Food and Consumer Safety at the Iowa Department of Inspections, where I had the opportunity to meet him. He is past president of AFTO and current co-chair of the association's Laws and Regulations Committee. He also has served as the chair and co-chair for the Manufactured Food Regulatory Program Alliance. He's past president of the Mid-Continental Association of Food and Drug Officials. He has a JD from Drake University Law School, and he has completed graduate work in food safety at Michigan State University. So, Steve, I'll now turn it over to you, please. Well, thank you, Mandy. It's great to be here. And we're uh, wonderful to uh, get to work with you all today and talk with you a little bit more about what our regulatory partners uh, do and how they relate to the industry. Uh, first, I'm going to start with a little background and talk about what the Association of Food and Drug Officials is, or AFTO. AFTO uh, is kind of a unique association and that we actually predate any federal regulation of food or drugs. Uh, we are one of those unique groups that actually was involved in lobbying for the first federal uh, federal um, regulation of food and drugs uh, in the 1890s, uh, which resulted in the Pure Food Act in 18 or 1906 and the Meat and Poultry Inspection Act in 1906. So very unusual as uh, association that we can actually say we were there before the beginning of much of this work. Um, but we work every day to bring together and connect um, industry regulators, academia, and all professionals working in the food safety sector and provide a forum for them to share about the, their their disciplines um, and their best practices with the goal of impacting the regulatory environment and providing better protection for the health and welfare of the global community. As you might imagine during COVID-19, we have been doing a lot of interacting with our partners across industry and, uh, and academia and others uh, trying to get the best practices out there to our colleagues um, in the industry along with uh, our regulatory colleagues that are you know, working in a, a new environment that has never happened before and that there isn't a lot of guidance. So we've been doing a lot of development in that world. Let's go ahead and move to the next slide. Today I'm gonna primarily talk about foodborne illness. So um, from a scientific perspective, where we are at today on foodborne illness investigation has changed dramatically in the last five years. Five years ago, we were operating under technology that was pretty similar to a fingerprint. So, and I've got a picture of, of, of a, a PFG or pulse filled uh, gel electrophoresis analysis. So you get some bands, it gives you an idea of a comparison. Today, we're operating in the world of whole genome sequencing, which is much more like a, a true DNA uh, fingerprint. So we have much more information. Or if you think of it like this, let's just pretend you have a book in front of you. PFG is a little bit like comparing the chapter names. So we could look at the individual illness and potentially the, uh, the, uh, the um, bacteria or pathogen found in the food or perhaps in the environment and compare them and see if they looked alike. But we're really comparing the chapter names. With whole genome sequencing, it's like we're comparing every word in the chapter to see if they are indeed the same organism. So, that, uh, so it's become much easier for us to make those connections when I say that and say, yes, this is related. We couldn't always do that before because with, the, uh, with PFGE, there were sometimes where you were, we're just not sure. It looks close, but it may or may not be related. Uh, with whole genome sequencing, we're in a much better spot. Let's move to the next slide and talk a little bit more about some of the things that are happening. Uh, I also did show you, uh, wanted to talk a little bit about, uh, at the same time, we're seeing a dramatic change in how um, our medical professionals are, are um, uh, detecting foodborne illness also. So five years ago, if we went to the doctor and we said we had uh, GI symptoms, the doctor was most likely to say, go home, 
If you don't get better in a week or a few days, come back. Not going to run any tests. The large reason that was is because they had to actually get a stool specimen, send it off for analysis, and three or four days later probably get a result. So they were actually literally plating it like the Petri dish you're seeing on the, le on the left side uh, of your screen, and that took a lot of time. Today, within an hour, they can run a test that's standard in most uh, clinical offices now, and they can detect 22 of the most common foodborne illnesses, including viruses, um, uh, bacteria, and um, also um, parasites. So this is very, very powerful and gives them very quick information. The challenge I'll just tell you is it still means we need a stool sample from the, from the uh, ill person, which is another whole challenge. Uh, I'll just give you a hint. That is not something the average consumer wants to provide, uh, even if they're sick. Though I will say the more ill they are, the more, more willing they are to provide has normally been my uh, personal experience. Let's move on to the next slide and talk a little bit more. The other thing that is really uh, changing over time is uh, detection methods. Uh, when how, you, uh, how we get that information has really evolved uh, in the last five years, too. Uh, there's really four ways that we normally get information on a foodborne outbreak. The first is um, they call the establishment. They call uh, the, the regulated entity and say, hey, I think I, I might have got sick from your establishment. Uh, then often the next step is the regulated entity calls the regulator and says, hey, I don't know what to do. I just got this phone call. That is uh, often uh, the next step in, in what we uh, do. The other thing that often happens is they'll call the regulatory agency or the health department and say, hey, I think I got sick from this place, which begins a whole process uh, also and, and normally comes in as one of those complaints Mandy was just talking about and begins a whole cycle. The third option that happens is a healthcare provider takes one of those tests we were just talking about and finds a positive result. States typically have the, most of the foodborne illnesses as mandatory report items where if they get a positive result, they have to report that to the health department, whether that be the state or local health department, and then uh, the health department investigates those illnesses and, and works with the regulatory agencies to, um, to then to help figure out what's happening if there's a and talks to the consumer, does a lot of detailed interviews with the consumer. Uh, often that can take 30 to 45 minutes with each one, depending on the type of illness, uh, particularly some of the more challenging illnesses that have a long uh, uh, duration between the on, uh, onset and potential exposure. Uh, you may have to do a week or 10 days worth of uh, foodborne history with them, which can be very complex. Um, the th and then the fourth thing that we've really seen change is the concept of social media and self-reporting websites and those sort of things. So I was poisoned.com is very common now. Yelp, you'll find uh, c uh, illness complaints on, or they'll post it on the uh, literally on uh, websites, including the establishment's website or our Facebook page or uh, Twitter, etc. Um, so all of those things come together and, and really um, help to pull together the information for uh, where there are potential illnesses. Um, so let's go ahead and move on to the next slide, and we'll talk a little bit more about what happens. So as I mentioned, there are a couple challenges when you hit any foodborne outbreak investigation. The first is stool samples are needed, and that's not always the easiest thing to get. The second thing is, particularly when we're in the retail food world, the food is often no longer available by the time we know there's an illness. Uh, it just happens that has such a quick cycle of in and out. Um, it's just often not available two or three days later when we have a suspicion of an illness. Um, third is the ill person is often not willing to provide that detailed food history or simply doesn't remember, you know, a week or 10 days worth of what they ate uh, and where they ate it and those sort of things. I will say there are some things that are really improving that, though. Um, first we've come around to figuring out a better way than necessarily needing the food. So one of the things that we now often do is look for the pathogen in the environment versus in the food. So we can go into a restaurant kitchen, for example, and we can use uh, and do environmental sampling with sponges and swabs and then, uh, then go ahead and analyze those and see if we find that pathogen there. It, I will tell you that in, uh, particularly when we're looking in some of those uh, uh, illnesses like salmonella, listeria, and neurovirus, 
it, you often do find it if you uh, suspect it's an outbreak source, finding it in an establishment in the environment often does happen, just because it's so hard to get it out of that environment once it's in the environment. So that's one thing that's much better. In addition, then if we find it in the environment or in the food, we can use the whole genome sequencing to see is this indeed related to the outbreak. The other thing that has changed with consumers um, is that most uh, consumers or many consumers are using credit cards and loyalty cards in both food service and the grocery environment. Almost everyone has some sort of loyalty program which tracks what they eat. Um, so, you know, it's pretty, uh, it's a little bit easier than it once was to get that information and get exactly what you had uh, than it was, uh, uh, you know, even a, a couple years ago because this has become so common. So those things really have made us a little bit more effective in finding foodborne illnesses. Let's move on to the next slide. So one of the things that will happen um, inevitably because of some of these scientific changes are we are likely to identify more outbreaks. Uh, that's just the reality. A lot of what used to be in what we would call background or simply undetected foodborne illness will be detected because there are more tests being conducted on the, on the patients. Secondly, we have a better way to relate them together than we did with PFGE, stuff that we might have said, oh, we're not sure. Well, now we, we can be much more sure with whole genome sequencing. Uh, the third thing that I would say is we're also better at investigating those outbreaks. We have better understanding of things such as environmental sampling. We have better interviewing techniques with both the consumer that is ill and the establishment. And, and our uh, inspectors across the country are getting better trained in root cause analysis and really getting to that next step of figuring out what happened and why. Um, we do expect that more smaller outbreaks will be identified in the future. Um, and, and we're beginning to see those numbers as you start looking at some of the new CDC data coming out, you're starting to see that uh, happen. So let's go ahead and move on to the next slide. So when you get that situation happening in, in your establishment or, or a firm, um, some of the things to think about uh, when you're collaborating with your, uh, your inspectors and health officials during an outbreak the first thing I would say is always ask questions. If you don't understand something, ask. Um, I will tell you I've worked with both the biggest and the smallest firms, uh, and um, doesn't matter who it is, oftentimes there are questions. Uh, I'm not afraid to bring in the epidemiologists, the medical professionals, the lab folks to talk with uh, those folks that are involved in the outbreak and help explain what's going on. Uh, that's very important, and it really makes the process go better. The second thing is, remember, people are getting are sick and potentially more are getting sick. So the faster you can provide information, the better it will be. So some of the things you're going to get asked for, recipes will be a quick one. Your processes will be likely. Sources of, your, of uh, the products uh, will be very quick, uh, early things, shipping records, et cetera. So be prepared for those sorts of things. The other piece of that is don't be afraid to say, I don't know. Um, because sometimes you'll have to go out and research it. Uh, don't guess uh, if you don't know. If you think you know, you might say, I think this is it, but let me verify that. Uh, often what we find in the outbreak situation is we get a piece of information early, and then it changes as we get further into the investigation. It's better to know that uh, this is what you think and you'll verify it than to not. So um, that's very helpful to the investigators. Um, the other thing I would say is um, be appreciative of early information. One of the things I encourage health officials and regulators is once you have the beginning, I'm going to say uh, you're beginning to see a trend, I, will talk, I would tell you always to talk to the establishment then. Why do I say that is because it gives you the ability to have information early and potentially minimize your risk and exposure. So I would say that is very important. Not everyone does that and not every establishment appreciates that, but I will tell you I have found it to be very effective and I can tell you there's some, uh, some times where we've 
impacted hundreds, if not thousands of people by doing that very, very early before we knew 100, you know, to, to we were at the point where we were sure that this is where it was or had a high level of certainty. When we're at that point of we think this is what it is, we would normally make that phone call and start the conversation. So I would encourage you to be appreciative of that. And I think the other piece is what I heard from firms when I was doing that was typically, hey, I would like to take action now. And then we'll figure out if this is right or not, because, you know, I can put something on hold, take something out of circulation today, and that minimizes my risk, uh, at least for going forward. Um, and they were always quite good about that. But be, be appreciative if you get that early uh, indication of information. Well, let's go ahead and move on to the, to the next slide. And that actually is ending my portion for today. Oh, Mandy, we can't hear you. Can you hear me now? We can. Somebody might have muted me. Great, great. I was just saying, not quite yet. I have a question for you. Okay. Uh, thank you for that information. Um, it was it was wonderful to walk through um, the investigation piece of it. And I know that you've been involved in many investigations. And I also have a, on another side. So from an industry um, perspective, I know that you mentioned to get information quickly to regulators. And um, we also want to know um, when test results come back. You mentioned swabbing and also mm -hmm. samples um, from either employees or guests. How would you suggest or what's your best advice for industry to communicate and to um, have somebody's information to get that back and forth quickly and be able to um, and get that as easy as possible. Well, I think first, the first thing that needs to happen um, uh, in an outbreak is to really establish those key coordination points. So from the firm or establishment or whatever, the industry perspective, who is going to be your key contact point for this outbreak? Mm -hmm. So, and, and the same with the regulator and the health department side. Um, my experience typically is we would designate, you know, a key contact from the regulatory and health side it was one person and a key contact from the industry. And those two talked a lot. Mandy, I know you were that person in one outbreak that we worked together and I was the other. We talked many times a day uh, during that outbreak, but that's okay. That's exactly what needed to happen. But what we find is that really um, gets that re a good relationship going and promotes that constant communication. The other piece of the puzzle is, you know, once again, don't be afraid to ask a question. If you're like, I don't understand what you're asking for, can you explain that? Or why do you need that? And when are the results going to come? And all of those things, ask those questions. They're happy to provide those. The other thing that I would urge our, our, on the regulatory community uh, and the industry both is don't be afraid to say, do you have preliminary results? And things like mm -hmm. that. Because a presumptive positive may not be a final result, but it may give you an indication and an idea. I'll give you a, a pretty good indication. I didn't very often see a uh, when we had multiple presumptive positives, them not uh, confirm out. Um, so if you know that, that gives you another day or so ahead of uh, information. So things like that are very good. Um, you know, complex outbreaks, I would not be afraid of doing a, a call every day at just a, a standard time. We're going to talk at whatever the time is. Um, we often coordinated that with when, we, when lab results came out just because that was helpful because we could give you the most recent information of what we had when we got the new patient information and all of that at the same time. Um, so that was something to think about. But I would tell you that frequent communication. Um, the other thing just to know, um, when you're in those outbreak scenarios and you're seeing new cases come in, it's going to be an ongoing process and it's probably not an eight to five Monday through Friday sort of thing. Um, those tend to continue throughout the the. Uh, non-working hours and on the weekends, um, I can tell you we've done a lot of those where it was Friday, you know, they often start Friday night at 5 p.m. and we're not joking. That is often when the outbreak begins and in, in, for some reason you seem to, uh, I, I think people are more likely to get tested and make complaints right at the end of the weekend. I, I shouldn't say that out loud, but or right before the weekend because they know they don't have to go to the emergency room that way. But we did see a lot of that and we spent a lot of Friday nights doing uh, beginning outbreak investigations and you know, uh, I, my staff all, uh, often work Saturdays and Sundays when we had a situation when we knew we had an outbreak going. 
we were uh, engaged in submitting that. And I'm sure that uh, Sandra and um, and Elizabeth have the same experiences uh, in their states. But uh, I would yeah. say those are key things is just really collaborate with industry, ask questions back and forth, you know, don't assume anything because that that is probably a mistake for everyone is to keep asking the questions and yeah. build those communications um, between the two organizations. Well, thank you. That's great insight and great advice. Um, uh, now, you did mention this, so let's shift over a little bit into regulatory relationships, which leads into that um, Liz Worsing serves as the Senior Environmental Health Program Manager at the Vermont Department of Health. Uh, her role includes directing the food and lodging program work in retail food manufactured food, shellfish, and lodging. She's been there since 2010. She oversees compliance activities and other regulatory programs for the Division um, of Environmental Health. She completed her Master's of Public Health and Epidemiology um, at Ebony University, Rollins School of Public Health, and the CDC CSPE Applied Epidemiology Fellowship Program. She's a board member of Northeast Food and Drug Officials and she currently serves on AFTO's Board of Directors. So Liz, could you please take us through building some positive regulatory relationships? Be here. So as uh, Steve mentioned, building regulatory relationships is really important, especially before an outbreak or an emergency situation occurs. Um, this will really help with promoting better communications and making sure that establishments know who to reach out to as their regulatory partners. And, and regulatory partners can also know who to reach out to at the establishment. Similarly, it can help when considering new novel methods at establishments, so implementing uh, new complex processes or a new innovative program in your establishment that you want to work with regulators uh, to do. It also really helps with developing stronger food safety partnerships, which is important and beneficial for everyone. So engagement should be at the brand level. If it's a national organization with regional or national locations, it's good to have contacts uh, at that level with the regulatory partners, but also at the local level. So as Steve mentioned, if there's an outbreak in a state or in a city, uh, please, you know, it's, it's helpful to know who, who the regulators can reach out to and who the establishment can reach out to at that local level as well. Next slide, please. So how do we build these regulatory relationships uh, and uh, with establishments? So attending regulatory meetings can be really helpful to meet new people in a non-regulatory way. Um, AFTO has an annual conference uh, each June around the country, and there's also six regional affiliates that are independent and have their own membership board and conferences and local training opportunities. So information about those affiliates can be found um, on the AFTO website. The SBA also holds retail seminars for retail stakeholders, and those are held in each region normally each year. This year, some of them have been virtual, um, which may continue, but that is a really helpful resource. And also, the National Envi Environmental Health Association um, has conferences and has some state and regional affiliates. It's also helpful to set up regulatory meetings in states where your organization operates or has a presence. Um, this is a good way to introduce uh, new equipment or techniques that you may be using. And periodically, people or personnel change at uh, regulatory organizations and also in your establishment. So keeping in touch with the current personnel is important. And then certainly encouraging periodic discussion throughout the year. If you have a question, reach out. If you have um, a, new, a new program, reach out. And similarly, the regulators will reach out to you as well. Next slide, please. So one thing that is pretty common in most states is having some sort of food protection task force, or it may be called something else that is an opportunity for stakeholders to get together for a common food safety goal or 
initiative. Um, and this map shows in green the 26 states that have a task force that uses some um, FDA funding, a small amount of funding to support meetings, uh, the cost of meetings. Um, and additionally, there are 14 additional states um, where they have a task force or some sort of organization even without funding. So um, most states, if you want to get involved, there may be regular meetings where food safety issues are discussed and stakeholders can be involved. Um, and this information um, is on the FDA website. Next slide, please. So sharing some tips for interacting with regulators, and some of these may seem obvious but are important to just reiterate. So, so first, being respectful, including of time. So don't leave your inspector sitting and waiting for an extended period of time. You want to start off your inspection or your uh, emergency meeting together on the right foot, and um, being respectful of everybody's time is important. You want to know your facts. Don't provide inaccurate information and, you know, provide the information requested. If, if you believe there's a reason that the info can't be provided or you don't know the information, just tell, tell the inspector that information respectfully and, and you'll have some time to get the information. At the end of the day, the establishment and the inspector have the same goal, which is food safety for the public. So um, working together is an opportunity to collaborate during inspections and some of these emergency events. Most of the time, inspectors are generalists. They may be trained in a variety of food safety inspection areas. So it, they may not be familiar with your piece of um, advanced equipment. And so it's really helpful if you offer to just explain how the process works if it seems like they might be confused. And that's a good opportunity to just have a dialogue and a conversation. If there happen to be issues, um, it's best not to escalate them up several levels immediately. Start at the lowest level. So reach out to the inspector that conducted your inspection or that you're working with to um, communicate first about an issue. Trying to resolve issues as soon as possible is helpful, and sometimes delay will lessen the chance of success. If you have a major change in your establishment, it's helpful to visit with regulators and let them know what's happening ahead of time. That's a good way to get questions answered and get them aware of a change you might be making. And then, as mentioned before, don't be afraid to ask questions. Questions are always welcome. Next slide, please. So what if we disagree with inspection results? And this happens from time to time. Um, what seems to work well is approaching disagreements really constructively from a constructive approach. So instead of approaching or saying something like, my inspector is awful and doesn't know what they're doing, they don't understand my opinion at all, it might be more productive, it will be more productive to approach something more from a tact of, I'm really unclear about this violation. Could you explain this further? And that opens a discussion. If you have an issue, be prepared. Um, have evidence and show why you think something might be wrong. In general, it's typically harder to dispute observations, visual observations, but it's, sometimes there may be a, a difference with the application of the regulations. So having a discussion is always welcome. You'll want to present your concern as soon as possible, trying a phone call rather than an email uh, so that you can have a conversation versus an email back and forth. And it's helpful to follow up after the call with an email. A written response really shows that you take the findings seriously and helps uh, reinforce the conversation and get everyone on the same page. Next slide. Okay, I'll turn it back over to you, Mandy. Okay, thank you, Liz. That was great. Um, I really, really appreciate the um, comments about making sure that uh, we ask a lot of questions going through uh, the walkthroughs, but also sharing knowledge from the restaurant as well, um, taking into consideration that regulators don't always know um, everything that's going on in the operation in order to have that um, back and forth and understanding. It's good to share both ways. So you also mentioned um, engagement, uh, following up, 
and all of these um, these special uh, words of advice for industry, but you also mentioned personnel changes. So how do we find out who to follow up with and who to call, especially in emergency situations when something comes up and we don't have it written down, who to contact? Do you have any advice for us? Yeah, if your organization uh, wants to know who the regulatory partners may be in your state or even in a local area um, in a variety mm -hmm. of topics, um, a really good resource is the Directory of State and Local Officials, uh, DSLO. Mm -hmm. And that is actually um, a really good resource that is maintained and kept up to date with current contacts on a regular basis. Um, and actually, you can access that directly from the AFTO website, but you're able to search for a certain state in a certain area and find out, for example, who the um, food program manager is for retail food or who the laboratory contact is. Um, so, so that's a great resource uh, and has varying levels of um, locality to it as well um, for folks to look at. Oh, excellent. Thank you very much. That's awesome. Um, Let's move on next to Sandra. And um, we know that virtual inspections have been a unique way um, to bridge that partnership of food service operations and regulations during this time when we can't always be um, traveling as much as we, as we used to. Um, Sandra has a Bachelor of Science in Agriculture and 38 years of experience in environmental health programs. Uh, she's been director of the Division of Food and Lead Risk Assessment since 2005. This division provides statewide oversight of the retail, dairy, and manufactured dairy food, bottled water, soft drinks, and ice uh, regulatory programs, as well as assessments uh, for children and their elevated blood levels. She's an active member of CFP, and she's currently the co-chair of the Recovery um, Committee Program for Food. So, Sandra, could you please take us through um, virtual inspections and, and what we should expect as, as they're increasing in numbers today? Good morning, everyone. Be glad to uh, kind of tag in on it, what everybody else has been talking about. Um, virtual inspections, of course, were something that everybody kind of had been thinking about anyway. Uh, we've been thinking about using them as follow-up. and. You know, it was just a thought, something back there in the back of our mind. Everything was going great, and then all of a sudden, March occurred. And our governor said, you're not going anywhere. <laughs> our, our, you know, everything got shut down. So um, here we were. We had a couple of facilities out there that were ready for a permanent inspection and needed to open, and we weren't able to go out in the field to assist them. So they, uh, we got together and talked about it. The operator asked us if we would be willing to do it on FaceTime. And we said, sure, we'll give it a try. And uh, that was how everything got started for South Carolina. We did a pilot on a, a, a permit inspection. We developed an SOP from that that basically all of our future virtual inspections grew out of. Um, to make it work, we had to develop some disclaimer language that, uh, you know, was included on the permit inspection that was going to allow us to capture anything that we might have missed on our virtual walkthrough because our regulation requires 100% compliance with the reg for a permit. So we wanted to be able to pick up anything if we happened to miss it. And then we also had to develop an acknowledgement email process to use in lieu of signatures since we weren't out there having them sign our pad. Next slide, please. So I, from that, we got to thinking about, well, what else can we do other than permit inspections? And we developed what we called a food safety check. Uh, it was, again, based on the process we use for the virtual permit inspection, but we decided that this would we needed to reach out to our facility. Um, we wanted something, everybody was stressed, so we wanted something that was non-scored, but we wanted to focus on our food safety risk factors. So what we developed out of that was something that allowed, you know, the virtual process allowed for social distancing. 
Uh, it allowed us to check on the necessary level of food safety that everybody needed for day to day, even if all they were doing was takeout or delivery. It was non-graded, uh, focused on compliance assistance and education because everybody had a lot of questions about what to do about the COVID side. Um, it allowed us because we have an electronic form that we can manipulate in our form that we email back to them. We provided links to our guidance tools that we had developed and put on our website so that they could easily get access to signs and, and additional information that they needed on how to deal with COVID. And they were quick. They took about 30 minutes to complete. Next slide, please. So we went on with those thinking that this was going to be short term and May, June rolled around and we were still pretty much not going out in the field. So we decided in June that we needed to step it up and we had seen some things that we thought were gaps in that, that food safety check that we wanted to address like more temperatures, more checking of temperatures. So on July 1st, we changed up and rolled out something we're calling a limited scope inspection. And again, it's virtual and we talk about the risk factors. They are educationally based, but we upped the game a little bit and we changed them to be a pass fail. But we didn't want to make the fail bar really high. So to fail the inspection, they have to have three or more items that they just cannot correct during the virtual conference. Um, if you can correct it, then it, you're going to get an okay on it. So again, this was developed that, to develop that partnership to keep that educational focus going and to keep that conversation going. Next slide, please. So to make it all work, again, we had to create forms in our electronic reporting system that were different from our regulatory inspection form. We wanted to make it very clear that this was something else. But it also let us have questions in there that were for the things that weren't covered in our regulations, such as face covering, social distancing, uh, self-service issues, um, and it leaned heavily on, you know, good personal hygiene. Um, we did narrow it down, those, both the food safety check and the limited scope inspection. Uh, we removed all the good retail practices. They are just narrowed down to the major risk factors. Uh, and the questions that are in our system, our system allows us to have conditional questions that allows the inspector to put in comments. And again, it allows us to also have links in there so that people can click on the link when they get their, their email uh, report back and go directly to our website on the topic they might need additional information on. Next slide. The feedback is positive. Um, all of our virtual inspections have allowed for a great deal of interactive and risk-based discussion, and also discussion of things that is more than just food code. We can talk about the COVID issues. We can talk about the governor's emergency orders that nobody understands. Uh, it really allowed us to talk about things that, that weren't a part of our regular inspection process. And more than that, when we first started these back at the 1st of April, the consumer needed customer confidence. They needed to know that somebody was out there checking on food safety during this time period. So our completed checks and the limited scope inspections have been posted and are still posted on our website, as well as we also provide a list of places that have done their virtual check or inspection. Uh, this way, anybody can, same as our routine inspections, they've always been posted on our website. We have a website called Food Grades where anybody can go and look at the last three years history on a facility. So they can go and look and see who's gotten their limited scope inspection or their food safety inspection since we started doing these in April. Also, by completing one of these virtual inspections, it's part of the educational requirements for our state Palmetto Priority Program. And this is a program that the South Carolina Restaurant Lodging Association developed to certify facilities that were adhering to the COVID-19 operating guidance. 
it was, again, another thing to build customer confidence, something that the industry desperately needed. Next slide. So some of the positive lessons that we got out of all this was don't be afraid to try something out. Um, you know, try it once. If it doesn't work, oh well. But if it does, you're going to have a great product, and you can fine-tune it as you go along. You know, you can make good protocols for full implementation after you do a pilot program or two. And if, even if it's a bust, you'll learn something from that as well. And the other biggest piece that I'm going to take out of this and that we've taken out of it is the announced inspections are an extremely useful compliance tool. They're less stressful. You can foster that really great engaged relationship where we are talking back and forth as partners, not as I'm here to get you on something, which unfortunately a lot of operators think that's our mindset. It's really not. Uh, but Sometimes I'm sure it seems that way from the other side of the aisle. Uh, and the other thing I think I've seen and our inspectors have commented on is that the person that is out there doing the virtual side of it learns how to be us. They learn what it is that we're out there looking for. They're looking at it from a totally different perspective than they would be normally. It gives them a chance to be the inspector and to learn how to self-inspect. And, and I think they really, a lot of our operators have said that they've just, this has really opened their eyes to some things. Uh, it, it's very engaging. Next slide. Unfortunately, of course, with technology, there are always challenges. Um, there are some places that just don't have cell service. Uh, South Carolina has some rural areas where you just aren't going to have cell service. Um, and on the other side, with the bigger chain, um, sometimes the uh, PIC or the manager does not have a company device and the company doesn't want them using their personal device, and that's understandable. So we've had to do some workarounds on that where we'll either work with a corporate QA person that does have a company device um, you know, that's, that's been the best solution for that one. But I would encourage those folks that are structured that way to maybe think about having a generic device for each store because virtual inspections, I assure you, are here to stay in some form or another. They, they've been way too successful to go away. Another problem we've had, of course, is the language barrier. Um, it, Sometimes you just can't communicate what it is you're wanting to do with the people, even when you're using a translation service. They just don't get it. So sometimes there are some facilities that you're just not going to be able to do a virtual inspection on. And then on our side, we have seen that because it is non-graded, because it is non-compliance, um, and we're not using it for enforcement, we have had a couple of operations that just kind of blew us off about fixing stuff. Um, so those, that's a little issue, too. You've got to have a system where you can follow up with a, a on-site routine if they're not going to play nice. But, uh, you know, again, this is an opportunity to do something without getting a score for it. So um, I strongly encourage people to correct things and um, to get it done because it is to their advantage to do so. And next slide, if there is one. I can't remember. Oh, yes. What are the future uses? Uh, well, we have expanded ours to not only be new permit inspections, but we're also using them on change of ownership where we're doing both the virtual permit inspection and our food safety inspection at the same time so we can capture that information of those places that change hands while they're still in operation. Um, I do see it as a useful tool, again, for what we originally were thinking about using them for, which was follow-up inspections. Um, any announced inspection should be able to be done virtually if the technology allows. So once we go back to doing regular routine inspections in South Carolina, we will be piloting a process for uh, follow-up inspections. And then also the limited scope inspection will allow me to use my limited inspection staff 
to provide more compliance assistance to facilities between our regular routine inspections. Um, either the facility could request one if they felt like they needed to find out if they were back on track, or we could just offer it for our more complex facilities that, you know, we would like to be in four to six times a year, but realistically we're not getting there that often. But I could with a virtual inspection because that virtual inspection could be completed by uh, a staff person in an area that has more inspectors. Uh, we are a statewide program here, and we share our resources across the state. So if I could have one of my uh, central office staff here in Columbia do an inspection down in Buford where they might be shorthanded this week, uh, that's a great tool. That's a great use of my resources because I don't have to put them in a vehicle and have them drive three hours to Buford. So there's, there's a lot of uses for virtual inspections that benefit both the industry and the regulator to, to get us back together more often because, as you know, the longer it is between your routine inspections, the more likely you are to get out of compliance. So this would give us an opportunity to be back there with you in some way more often. And I think that's all I've got. I don't think Thank there's you. another slide. I don't believe so. And we are getting close to the time. I We have so many questions that have come in about virtual inspections, asking to see your website, um, good alternatives. And we also have some questions about online food histories, Steve, that we could um, ask at a later time. So what I think we're gonna do is we will get the answers to these questions and um, possibly put them up on the um, on one slide at the end under Q and A when we repost um, the webinar. And um, if you have any additional questions, you can send those over to me at mandy.fedlac at ecolab.com. So it's m a n d y dot s e d l a k at ecolab.com. Uh, so we will send those over um, at the at the end um, or when we post that up online. So we can go ahead and go to the next slide so that we can close out. Um, another question that comes up, and, we, and why isn't everyone on the same version of the food code, Steve? I see that you have um, a lot of your answers up here um, as well, which is something that I think that we could have a whole nother um, a whole nother uh, webinar on, yes? Yes, that is true. <laughs> okay, great, great. Um, the next slide, um, really, before we uh, move on to the next slide, I just wanna thank our panelists, Steve, Liz, and Sandra. We really appreciate your time, expertise, and your partnership. Um, also, thank you to everyone that attended today's session. Uh, it's great to have you all here and for your questions, and, and we'll make sure that we, we answer those um, when we go ahead and upload the webinar. Um, three key points I think that we've taken um, away today. Uh, one, during foodborne illness outbreaks, one key contact um, from regulatory and industry helps that communication really flow. Um, I, we saw a few questions about regulatory partnerships. Um, Liz already asking about the website. It's at the Association of Food and Drug Officials website. Um, that's AFTO. Um, and also very interesting about um, virtual inspections. We see that this is a great partnership, an awesome time to ask questions. This is new for regulatory and for industry. So really use this opportunity um, if they're scheduled to get people on board and um, take part and really go ahead and ask those questions. So this has been fantastic, thank you, and great insight into how investigations and uh, health inspections are performed. Um, so we'd really like you to join us next Thursday for our third webinar in our series that will discuss new procedures and approaches um, to sanitation um, in food service. The next slide shows that that's Ed and Casey that will be delivering that message. And our final webinar is on uh, September 30th. We will have a panel, as I mentioned, of food safety experts, and they'll dive into new and emerging trends um, in the food service industry. So thank you again for joining us today. Um, goodbye, and stay safe. Thank you.